the garments of different kings wore and that the nobility wore, and these were the garments that actually he says really mimic what they were giving to the Kohen because it's really serving Hashem. Maybe that's, that's why Ashverus was wearing it. He was a king, huh? He wanted to show off that he was the king, and therefore he was. Well, that's I guess inverted logic. He wanted to take the garments of the Kohen to wear to show that he was, I guess, the Kohen of Hashem, the king of Hashem. Correct. But what we're saying is the other way around. The Kohen is meant to dress up in these things in a way that's inverted. Okay? So far so good? So uh, and if you look here in um, verse 28, just to pick up a couple of these same th- of the themes on page 464, and then I'll show you something which is not from Ramban. 464, page verse 28, verses 1 and 2, chapter 20, I should say, verses 1 and 2. Uh, therefore, bring Hakrevi Lecha Daron Achicha, bring Aaron your brother and Benavi Tomi Tov Bnei Israel from the Jew from Bnei Israel, the Chanoli to make them um, minister to me, to be Kohanim to me. Aaron not the Benavi or Lazar Nitamar Bnei Aaron, and you're going to put on Viasita Big Day Kodesh and Aaron Lechicha Lechavol Tefaret. You're going to put on the garments of of Kodesh for Aaron your brother Lechavol Tefaret for glory and for splendor. Okay. So that's what this first Ramban on the handout that I gave you, which points out that these are all garments that kings wore, which were meant to give them honor and distinction and, and regal garments, which the normal people did not and could not afford to wear. And as importantly, this made a recognition of who they were. There's also a piece in this Ramban which is I don't really fully understand, which is about a Kabbalah piece, which is about Kavod and Teferis, different levels of Kedusha, and I'm not going to go into it because I don't know if I can explain it that well. Okay, but here's here's the other part. Um, I want to introduce you to another commentary besides the Ramban today. Okay, you ready for another commentary besides Ramban? Good. Then you'll be the sheet. Yes, Malbum, a mayor Lebish Malbum, who you have actually heard about in Ema Barim Smecha. Do you remember, I think we did it right before I went to Israel, and I told you when Rameir Leibish Malbum printed his commentary on Sefer Daniel, so people asked him, how could he, when, how could he talk about years of when the Sheikh was coming? You're not, supposed to, you're not supposed to reveal those kinds of things. And remember the story he gave? So he wrote like a response to all, the, all his critics, and he said, the reason I'm going to do it, because it's like the story of the father who took his son after his bar mitzvah to a trip to Leipzig. This was a trip that took a number of weeks to go, and they're traveling, they get in the wagon, after two, three hours the kid says, are we there yet? And the father says, oh, shut up already, you know, keep quiet. And then after about one of the two, three weeks, they finally get there, they're maybe half a day awake, and the father says to the wagon driver, are we there yet? And the wagon driver says, well, right over the hill we'll be in Leipzig. And the kid says to the father, I understand, when I ask the question, you shut me down. How come you're asking the same question? The answer is, when you're that close, you're allowed to ask the question. I mean, the joke about kids asking, are we there yet, is of course the joke about the kids who are asking while we're still traveling how far to go. No one would have, would have said if the child asks, when you're seven-eighths of the way there, are we there yet? They usually ask after the first hour of the journey. So the Malbun writes the same thing, we are close to the end of time, so I'm allowed to kind of predict certain dates that I think Mashiach will be coming, or to be and so forth and so on. This is the same album. So the Malbun writes here in commenting on this idea where it says, in these two verses that we, re- we learned, that you're going to make the big day Kodesh for Aaron Achich and Lechavod for honor and for splendor, right, for glory and for splendor. So the Malbun says something very interesting. He says there are two types of garments. Okay, there's garments that, you know, you wear. Like, this, these are garments. They can be good garments. They can be, like the Ramban says, these are royal garments that they put on. Now, who, who is going to make those garments? There were artisans. There were tailors. There were people who were trained. There were chacham leiv. That's the garments that we normally talk about, the garments of our own. That's the picture I just showed you in the pages later on of the Kohen Gadol, right, how he's dressed up. But says the, says the Malbum, there's a different type of garment that we wear. This actually harks back to what we just talked about before. He says there are ways that we cloak our soul in this world. In other words, there's something inside of us that is very pure that we have to protect ourselves in terms of what he calls here, and I'll show you in a moment, deot and minot and midot and trunot tovot. These are good, good knowledge, good intellectual ways to understand things, good midos, good character traits, good trunot tovot. These are, all, these are all accessories to the inner soul. The soul itself is so pure, think of this as, as some kind of fire. You need to put it into some kind of encapsulation to hold on to it, to use it, to direct it. 
So the, the garments that we're talking about, the karnim, is what, Aaron, what Moshe is saying to Aaron here, or what God is saying to Moshe, that you will take Aaron and tell him to be in, in wearing these garments. It's not only about the real garments, but something more basic, which is the garments for the neshama itself. Okay? So that's this on the last page here, or the back side of the page here, where it says Malbum. It's the second side. I didn't, I didn't number the side. Sorry, me bad. Okay? But you see where it says Malbum? On the, on the, right, okay? It's commentary of the Malbum. So it says, Vyosisa Big Day Kodesh. It's just going to read a couple lines here, then I'll read for a little bit from the second paragraph on the bottom. Vyosisa Big Day Kodesh. The garments that Moshe is told to dress Aaron in are uh, initially they appear to be external garments. She is appearing in your It's going to explain to us in the parsha how the artisans made them in their work. But that's not what Moshe does. So says the album Avo Bemet Hayu Morim Avo Gadim Pnimim Shiasu Kone Hashem Labish Bamedam Shotehem. This actually what Moshe is told to make sure that the, the Aaron and the sons are dressed in kavod and teferet is how they're going to enrobe their soul with deot of midot of tchunot tavot sheim abush and efesh and proper attitudes and proper nimusim proper manners proper character traits to make the purity of the soul not become not become defaced, not become um, deteriorated. And the, um, these were not made by artisans. Artisans can't make this kind of thing. Who makes it? So God tells Moses, you will make sure that I want to dress these garments. How you, what does this mean? You're going to teach Aaron and his sons how to improve their souls, how to make their souls work best, and their midot and their character traits. Be oven, sheal, bishu. Hod v'hadur et nafshotem apnimit. Nor that they will enrobe with beauty and glory and splendor the internal soul that's there. Isn't that a lifetime job? It is a lifetime job, but you have to you have to be sensitized to it. But it sounds like they're going to just snap their fingers and Aaron is going to be a different person. Well, um, is getting in shape a lifetime job? Is getting in shape? It is. Right, but if I have a coach. Yes. The coach can give me, if I go to a physical therapist, or I go right. to an occupational physical therapist, and they give me certain exercises that can improve a certain muscle, I don't need to see them every day. Now, I, go, I would want to go back to the PT, or I would want to go back to my personal trainer to improve myself. But if I want to maintain where I'm at, I, once I know how to do it, I, I do it. Okay. Right? So in other words, but, so Moshe is going to show to Aaron how to take... Because these are people who are spiritually sensitive individuals who are going to become close to the Almighty. Well, I think what the Malbum was trying to say, and tell me if you think I'm wrong, or tell me if you think I'm right, give me some feedback at least, <laughs> that you can have a soul, and the soul can, be, the soul can be dragged in the mud, and you can't find it. In other words, if you just want to, I'm just going to draw an application. Which this is not what the Malbum said. This is what Yaris is saying. Every one of us has a soul. Everyone has a soul, a light that burns bright inside of us. But sometimes it gets filthy, and sometimes it gets muddy, and sometimes you don't even know how to find it. So you can have a person who is a very, a very holy individual, right? But you can't identify who they are. They can't identify even themselves. They have to work to scrape away all the gunk that's coming up the machinery. So that's what it's saying. With these people being an, being an Aaron or being a Kohen, it's not simply about just wearing external garments. It's not just simply, you know, just being the king. Then you can be an Achashverosh to do that. It's about something that's really inside of you to discover what it is. You, Moshe, you've got to tell the Kohanim how to kind of do that. You've got to tell them how they need to do, I don't know, spiritual exercises, meditations, thinking about what their soul is, discovering their souls. I don't know, maybe reading Kabbalah, whatever that could mean. I'm not sure what it means here, but it's simply saying to Moshe, there's something more that the Aaron and the sons need to dress up besides actually dressing in these garments. And that's telling us that Moshe Rabbein is already at that stage. And that's telling us... Mm-hmm. Aaron, he's got to right. Well, Moshe Rabbeinu was at the stage and he was sensitive enough to receive communication from Hashem very directly. Go. So was Aaron. True, but not as clear. Okay. okay. Right. Correct. Okay. When, where does Pasha's true Mantitzava take place? This, by the way, is another question. Where historically do these, do these p- chapters take place? At the mountain. Okay, when at the mountain? Just like after Kabbalah Satara. When after Kabbalah Satara? 
That's actually a good discussion. Right. Commentaries have a lot of opinions. Before or after the tablets? I'm sorry? Before or after the tablets? Before or after the tablets are broken. Either before or after the tablets or before or after the sin with the golden calf. Before or after the sin with the golden calf. In other words, the concept of even building a tabernacle becomes a way to restore the sanctity of the Jewish people, which may have been desanctified through the worshiping of the golden calf, which, by the way, we'll get to next week, not this week. But even though these parsha are the before, they either really take place after, and we say, Ein Mukta Mucha Batora, or they were given before because the Almighty had this premonition, as if to use that term, that what would take place in the future, the Jewish people would need this to restore their sense of sanctity, which they desanctified. So, and Aaron, Aaron himself. Yeah, Makro Trufa Matka. What is it? Makdim. Makdim Trufa Lamaka, that God gives the prescription before you get sick. This is preventative, like probiotics or something. Um, but and Aaron himself is sullied in the story of the golden calf. Right. Because Aaron is the one who collects all the money, all the gold and silver, and they pops out the calf. That's next week. We're not going to give away this week next week. Especially since you haven't prepared it yet. Okay? Yeah. I guess maybe I'm just advancing things, but here's uh, Moshe Rabbeinu uh, teaching Aaron and his sons. Yes, correct. We know from the story later on that the sons get... What, uh, well, they died. They died. True. So like, I'm assuming then they didn't learn anything. Or they made a, the, or they touched high tension wires. You can learn a whole lot. You can know about electricity, and then if you're not careful and you touch a wire, you can get electrocuted. Right. So you can be you can be smart enough about about knowing electricity, and then you're I don't know you you're using a pole saw to cut down a tree, and you touch a live wire, and that's it. That doesn't mean that you didn't learn about electricity. We suddenly become grounded on a ladder or something. Okay? Yeah. Masha, everybody's soul before they enter this world is pure, correct? Uh, I believe so, yes. <clears throat> so, what was it about Moses that gave him what he, what he had? I mean, he grew up in a palace. He saw all kinds of idolatry. Right. How was he able to control it? Southern Yard. What did he have? Well, what did he have? He had. He had. No, he was given a gift by God. He just had a gift. Yeah. Right. Well, he was chosen by God and, and enhanced with the with what he was. And remember, God chooses Moses specifically because Moses is not just being raised. You talk about being raised in idol worship. He's raised in freedom. Okay. So let me just come back to this album. So the first piece of the album is really about trying to recognize that Aaron has to be our own. Anyone who wants to be spiritual has to discover what that soul is and has to work on their own person. The, the character traits are, let me kind of say it like this. I think the character traits are the connection between the soul to this world. In other words, you can appreciate someone who's spiritual when they have good character traits. They don't have good character traits. They've lost everything that's in there. They can't have an impact upon the world. They can't have an impact upon you. So that's the first piece of the album. This is about the internal garments that they're going to wear. The second thing, the last, the paragraph that follows says the album, but you know, you can't get away, says the album, from the fact that there are garments here. The whole, the whole, the whole part of the Sabbath is about wearing real garments. So, so you can't just, you can't just get, give me a, a, a parish to say this is talking about how you character traits, or you character traits of the garments for the Shema. That's true. What about the rest of this? The Malbum says something unique, that there were people who made, who, made the, who made the garments. So we said they were artisans. I use the term tailors. What does actually the Torah call them? It doesn't simply say they were workers. It calls them chacham leiv. They had some kind of super wisdom, some kind of cleverness. Now we always interpret this to mean that they, therefore they were clever in terms of tailoring and tel- clever in terms of building. And they knew, I don't know, they knew all the principles of physics and architecture and, 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 and sewing and weaving to make garments and to make utensils. So it's about character. And what the mob was going to say actually that these Chacham Lev people were even better than a normal person who's a Chacham. A normal person who's like a tzaddik or a chacham can actually, can actually work against his Yetzirah. But every day is a fight against the Yetzirah. Every day we get up, we have to struggle against the Yetzirah. The one who's the tzaddik or the one who's the chacham, he's able to, to be victorious. Now maybe, it becomes an, it, maybe it's not a difficult fight after a while, but it's still a fight. Chacham but that's the heart. Right, but the chacham lev is something more even internal 
that there's never even a question for him to fight against the Yitzhara. He has, he has reached such a level. These people who built these garments for, or are going to write, make these garments for Aaron and his sons, are on such a level to make these garments, they were chosen because they're not just the, the, the Chacham who fights against the Yitzhara. For them, there was never a fight. In other words, they had the Yitzhara beaten hands down. They scared the eight Sahara out of the ring before the fight even started. So they were not artisans. They were chosen. They were chosen for their ability, not because of their ability to physically make clothing. Anybody can be trained to do that. They were chosen because these people had no connection at all to sin. In other words, they, fought, they were able to reach the ultimate level. I'm not sure how they compare to Moses. Moses is, an, is a Navi, that's a different level. But in terms of the fight against the Yitzhara, they were able to, to reach the level where they never even thought, they, they never had to go to battle. It was just like, you know, they had reached such a level that the Yitzhara was even afraid to touch them. They could just knock it down with like a... So why don't we just read, and read how it says? So the Malbim continues, Ulam HaBagadim HaChitzonim, this is that last paragraph on the page, Shem Yermuzu HaBagadim Pnimiyot, V'zet HaSai Dei Umanim HaVikim Emelacha, the external garments, which remind us of the fact that there are internal garments that he was talking about until now, these were made through Umanim, through the artisans who knew the Melacha. Ulam, says the Malbim, even these artisans, Gam HaOanim Eilo, Tzarech Shiu Chach Meilev, Vehat Bichach Meilev, which I explained, I, I explained already in my parish on Sefer Shabbat Shalom, Sefer Mishlei, the book of Proverbs, but Kama Mokamot, Ki Chacham Leiv, Hu Madrigag Dolam Yol. The Chacham Leiv was a higher, very high level. Ki Chacham, a regular Chacham, Hu Mitnaheg Apichu Ki Chachma. He uses the rules of wisdom. Uvechol Zeh, Yesh Lodai Mechama Pnimi De Mayetzer. He uses his wisdom and his knowledge, it means intellectual knowledge of Hashem, to defeat, but he's still got to fight against the Yitzhahara. Avala Chacham Leiv, Hu Shia Chachma Sheba Liyot Kinyan Benavsho, Mamaleit Kol Batein Avsho, Kol Hon Yakar Benaim. He's got all this wisdom that is supernal, and he's able, Vyaydezer, Amar Hashem Leitiv Ruach Chachma. He's filled with the spirit of, of Chachma, who perish Lachachma Leiv Mufaresh, Misha Ruach Chachma Mamalim et Kolibo. There's no place in his heart for anything that's going to pull him down. There's no, there's no sense I want to waste time. There's no sense I need to relax. There's no sense that I can enjoy this world. There's no sense that this world, I, I can leave Hashem for a couple minutes. I am with Hashem 24-7. That's the, that's, the, that's the level he's on. So these were the people... Who are, who are making the Bugadim, so the, the, they have the wisdom level, not so much about making garments, anybody can do that, they have the wisdom to understand what their role in life is really all about, and they can therefore include or in, in, invest in the garments that they make, this, this idea of what they're teaching Aaron as well as they begin to cloak Aaron and measure him out, so to speak. Um, these are the ones who are going to make the garments because they really understand the garments that are external are only really mimicking the garments that are internal. And they realize these people understand that the garments that we wear are only a feeble shadow of what's really the internal garments that are wrapping our souls, which is about the midos tovos that we have to build in this life. So that's what the Malvin was trying to say. The very unusual interpretation about what the garments are for our, our own. The real garments are inside. The real garments are what we cloak our soul. The external garments that we cloak our body, that's only secondary. Having the Chachmei Leif, who are people who are so holy, they had no idea, no, no, no sense of losing out to the Yitzhahara ever, because we all lose out to the Yitzhahara. We all, we all fight the battle every day. Some days we're more successful, some days less. These guys win it. They bat a thousand. They still tell, but anybody could be a tailor. No, not anybody can be a tailor. Right, not anybody. <laughs> Many people could be trained as tailors. Many people can be. Right. There are some better tailors and worse tailors. Right, but in other words, the concept of using a tailor who not only knows the trade of tailoring but knows the trade of spirituality—that's why they were chosen. So they're going to be the the, the additional way when they cloak Aaron, when they measure Aaron. They want to make it very clear, Aaron, what we're putting you on these royal garments is really not what you're really dressing up as. You've got to work on your soul to make it so show your, show, show your soul is holy. Okay? Good? 
Ramban. As opposed to the Ramban, the normal Ramban simply just talks about the fact, and that's what I don't want to do with you, the, normal, the first Ramban really just talks about the fact that these garments are garments that were worn by kings. Right? Malbum presents a whole different approach to it. Malbum says that this is about garments that are not worn only by kings. These are garments that are actually souls being in, enveloped in. When it says king, do we see any king wearing these robes? So the Ramban actually goes through them and says they, they, these, were, these were garments that they wore, the kings and the sarim and nobility wore in his day. Really? Uh, Who was making them? I don't know. Like the Mitznefet, for example. The Mitznefet of the... Re- I'll give you an example. Uh, the mitznefet of the regular Kohen is probably very similar to what the Cardinals' hats are. I, actually, I would like to say the other way around. The Cardinals' caps was really based upon what they believed what the Kohen Gadol's headgear was. Right? I, so, in other words, uh, the Ramban seems to go through all of them and he says that everything that's here were all of Vushay Malchut. And he goes through one after the other. Okay? Including, it's including the, the tzitz which we're going to talk about now, is was like the crown that the kings actually wore. So they would have something over their forehead. And the, uh, the me'il, the garments, the outer garments, the cloaks that they wore, and, and all the other items, he refers to again and again, these are what, we, what he sees in his day that are worn by Malachim and Sarim Gedolim, Lebush Malchut, and so forth and so on. Okay. No, I mean I can understand that because the Kohen Hagadol has to be a scene. You know, I mean he has to be something that you aspire to be. You know. Okay, we're good so far. Okay, let's take another Ramban. Um, can I just ask if is was Philippe okay? I haven't spoken to him. Okay, I haven't spoken yeah. to him either. I'll, uh, I'll, 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 I'll also email him, find out what's going on. Yeah. He was the only, he actually seemed, he emailed me a couple of times to Israel, just wishing me good wishes. So I want to make sure he's okay. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. It might be just the snow or whatever it is, not to worry. Okay, okay. Um, let's do another Ramban and then we'll come to talk about Nasir Shalom. This is chapter 28, verse 30. Chapter 28, verse 30, yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, so if you actually, let's just read verse 30, or maybe I'll just back up a step. You know about the breastplate of the Kohen Gadol? Sorry? Yeah. Had different stones. There were different, different, different precious and semi precious stones. And the stones represented the 12 tribes of Israel. Each one had the name of a tribe inscribed in it Ruvain, Shimon, Levi, Yehuda, and so forth. And. Um, and on the bottom, uh, and below it, it had the word Shifte Ka, Shifte Yud Hey. And if you go into all the stones, on all the inscriptions in each of the stones, each of the tribes was inscribed on the stones, plus the word Shifte Ka, you will have each one of the letters of the alphabet, of the ABC, of the alphabet, of the, of the Hebrew. So if you look, for example, on the picture, on page 470 at the bottom, that's your Choshen Mishba, that's your breastplate. Okay? Um, and... It looks the like cover is really it looks like the, it looks like the type of thing they put on. on it. Oh, it looks like a tablet. Yes, I was going to say it also looks like what we put on top of a Sifri Torah, as opposed to you know, the, the, the breastplate. Okay, so the Choshe Mishpat has this. It has uh, different settings, different rings, and different folds. And if you look into the picture itself, which will explain it more than be, what the Ramban is going to tell us, there's a fold where they would put in the Urim Vitumim. Okay, and it's not clear to us what the Urim Vitumim are. That's what this Ramban is going to talk about. So before we see the Ramban, let's go back and take a look at the Psukim themselves. Um, why don't I go back to 22? 22 till 30, the page before. So you're talking about Moshe, Moshe is told to tell Aaron to make a Choshen Mishpat which is going to be made woven, and it's going to be square. And actually, I need to go back a few pesukim before that. Verse 15, you make a breastplate of judgment, page 469 of a woven design, and you're going to put into it gold, different different types of, of, of wools and, and sewings there. 
and you're going to put stone mountings in verse 17, four rows of stones, a row of, and they list what the stones are, the second row, the third row, the fourth row, different types of semi-precious stones, and they will be on verse 21. The, it says that we have named Tiel Shmop and Israel. The stones be according to the names of the sons of Israel. Shtem Israel Al Shmo some twelve according to the names. Ish Al Shmo Pituche Kosam Ish Al Shmo Tiel Shnei Moshe Shavet. Each person will name will be engraved like a signet ring. Each according to the name that shall be for the twelve tribes. So in this breastplate with the twelve stones, each stone had a different tribe. Reuven was inscribed into the first stone. Shimon and Tzvi the second stone, third, and so forth. And what are you going to put? There are chains on the edges of verse 22, verse 23, verse 24, verse 25. Verse 26 is just simply the rings of gold that's there. And you're going to put it onto the aphode. And yeah, I'm going to move to 29. Sorry to keep you guys bouncing around here. So when you've, you've made this breastplate, then you've got the picture once again that we looked at before. So Aaron is going to bear in verse twenty-nine. When Asa Aaron shmot meisol b'choshim mishpat alibo, Aaron is going to carry the names of Bnei Yisrael on the choshim mishpat over his heart. This is why it's called a breastplate. The vol akodesh when he goes into the holy. Um, the zikaron lef neshem to me to remember as a constant remembrance before Hashem. So how does he carry the names of the Jewish people? Because he's all the tribes are written on the breastplate itself. And here's verse thirty: Into the breastplate of the judgment you shall place the urim and tumim. There shall be an Aaron's heart when he comes before Hashem, and Aaron shall be the judgment of the children of Israel on his heart constantly before Hashem. So when Atato ala rachol shem mishpat es urim v'atumim v'yu alev Aaron b'vol lef neshem. They'll be in the heart of Aaron when it comes to Hashem, and Aaron will carry the judgment of the Jewish people, the children of Israel, on his heart when he comes to Hashem. So, what are the Urim Vatumim? So, that's what's not clear about this puzzle. Well, it sounds like a, uh, a fold in the, uh, in the back of it. Well, it's folded. It like a folder, you know, and what did you put in there? So, what did you put in there? Your Coles notes. The Coles the, the notes of how to do the service <laughs> in the temple. What did you put into this fold? So it's not clear. In fact, they don't translate it. I thought it was, uh, you put in uh, Hashem's name. Anyway. Right, so that's what the Ramban is going to tell us, that you put in Hashem's name. And actually, if you look into the footnote in Mr. Art Scroll, you've got the Art Scrolls in front of you, you look at verse number 30 on the bottom, he's going to quote the Ramban. So we'll take a look at that before we see the Ramban inside. Um, the Urim and the Turim is noted about the breastplate was folded in half to form a pocket-like pocket. A pouch-like pocket into into it. Moses was inserted a slip of parchment containing the ineffable name, the holy name of Hashem. According to Ramban, there was more than one special name. This name was called Urim, from the word light, because it would cause the individual letters of the tribal names on the breastplate to light up. And it was called Tumim, from the word Tumim, which means completeness, because if read in the proper order, these luminous letters presented complete and true answers to the questions of national import that the coin god would ask of Hashem. We're going to give the Ramban, we'll give you a couple of examples. Okay, and actually, well, actually, he gives you the example here, so we can take a look at it before we read itself. Um, Ramban gives an example of how the process took place when the Jewish people crossed the Jordan and had to undertake the conquest of the land. The question arose which tribe should begin the war against the Canaanites. So Pinchas, the coin God, will enter a tabernacle and pose the question. So the name Judah lit up, and also the names Yud, Aleph, La, Yud, Ayin, Lam, and Hey, Ya'aleh. The coin had to know which, how, which, what this combination of letters represented because they could be placed in the several orders, thus forming different combinations of them. words. So he had a divine spirit, he had Ruach HaKodesh, would tell him to the men Yehuda Yala, which is how the first chapter of the book of Judges opens up, that first they would go fight, the tribe of Yehuda would be the first one to lead the battle. So Sefer Shoftim opens up about how they're going to finish conquering the land and wiping out all the pockets of resistance. Okay, um, let's leave this until we finish the rest of it. I'm sorry? This is a, this is a good business. Could it be a Kohen or to be a... The apple for... To... Well, you ask questions and it gives you answers. <laughs> That's true. Instead of carrying a cell phone around, you carry a cell phone. But you had to know how to combine the answers. No, no, I understand, but I'm just saying for it. Right, in the same way that today when you ask questions on the internet and carry a tablet, you have to know how to combine the answers, get the right answers. There's a lot of fake news that's out there as well, so this would be the same kind of thing. So, the Ramban actually is going to talk about this a little bit, and I'm going to do the Ramban with you um, over here on this first page. This first 30, you can actually get the 30 if you want to look at it inside there. 2830. Okay. This is about what the Urim Vatumim are. I'm just finding my thing here. Okay. Okay. 
So says the Rambam, Natata el haron, Natata chosh na mishpah et harim ve tatumim. Says the Ramban, Savar Rabbi Abraham. Once again, the Ramban brings down. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm sorry. I need. I am right here. Okay. 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 Savar Rabbi Abraham. Rabbi Abraham is the Ibn Ezra. As you know, the Ramban loves to take down. He's going to take him down, right? So, oh, that's such a bad man. We can't kind of really have a lot of more compassion. Savar Rabbi Avraham litchachem binyanu uvim v'tumim, and he thought to be smart in trying to instur- understand what the uvim v'tumim are. That's the that's the beginning of the sentence. It's a very long sentence. And what did he say? And he said, the Ibn Ezra said, Kihei masay uman kesev izahav. The Ibn Ezra thought that these Urim Vatumim were not what uh, Albert said, not what the Ramban is going to tell us. They were some kind of um, apparatus that was made of gold and silver. And he actually was, wrote, wrote a lot about this. Why? That he thought it was similar to what they had a lot of certain idol worshippers, certain you know, tea leaf readers, had certain contraptions that they used in order to help them determine the answers to the questions being given. The same way that if you read tea leaves, you look how the tea leaves are arranged, if whatever it is, I don't know how what they do, uh, Ouija boards and all this kind of stuff, but to know how to answer what the questions are. However, Velo Amar Klum, and guess what he says about the Rabbi Ibn Ezra? He said nothing. He thought to be smart, and he wrote a whole long extensive commentary what he thought the Urim Vatumim were, and he said nothing. But what are they? Avalheim Kedivri Rashi. Says the Ramban, no, it's really a lot more simple than that. It's more simple, more complicated, actually. Like Rashi says, which is, Kotav Shema Meforash. It's the holy name of Hashem. Which, by the way, the holy name of Hashem is very difficult for us to understand. What was the holy name of Hashem? Well, no, that is maybe how it's written. That's really how it's written. It's not even how it's pronounced. People think, people think that the Yud and the Hay and the Vav and the Hay is pronounced like Jehovah's Witnesses. It's not. All the Jehovah's Witnesses are using is we've put the dots on top of the Yud and the Hay and the Vav and the Hay, which spell out the words of Hashem. I don't know if people realize that. That's not how the name of Hashem is pronounced. All we've done is under the Yud, we've put um, the, the Shva, because under uh, the Aleph, it's a, it's a Chad of Patach, Ah. Uh, under the, next to the He, we've put an O, a Cholam, which is next to the Dalit. Under the Vav, we've put an O, a Kamatz, which is next to the Nun. That's how, but that's not really how the name of Hashem was pronounced. Nobody knows how it was pronounced. We don't pronounce it. But we don't even know how it was pronounced. Not that we don't pronounce it. I want to rephrase this. It's not that we, we know how it's pronounced and we don't pronounce it. We don't know how it was pronounced. When we have the dots on the letters, that's not how it was pronounced. Hold on, when you say was pronounced, it was pronounced? Well, the Kohen Gadol pronounced it on Yom Kippur. The Kohen Gadol pronounced it on Yom Kippur. So he's the only one that knew it. Right, only, only one that said it. And the people would hear it and they would bow down. They would hear it. They would hear him saying it. Yes, they would hear it. That's when when they when you when you fall down on the on the avoda on Yom Kippur in the Musaf, and we bow. That's when we're bowing on Yom Kippur. We're just recreating when people heard the name. They fell. They fell down prostrate. I don't understand, Masha. So there was a name. There, was, there is a name. There, there is a name that was pronounced back in the days of the Kohen Gadol. By the Kohen Gadol on Yom Kippur, which is the holiest of holy names of Hashem, that we have lost the understanding of how to say it. And when we write in the Sefer Torah the words Yud Hey, the letters Yud Hey Vav and Hey, and people think it's read like Jehovah's Witnesses. It's not the way it was pronounced. So that was so you and Abba, it was pronounced by the But not pronounced that way. We don't so of know. course, but it was pronounced right. yes. we don't know what it was. Dude. We don't know how to pronounce how it. We, how can you but we keep it all We don't basically make that she was lost. Things get things are not done actively, they can fall into oblivion. Because it wasn't done by everybody, it was done once a year. It was done only by Coin Godol. But all those millions of people heard it. Well, we have all this information. Well, we, we know everything else. We actually don't know everything else. We don't know everything else. We have it all here. But we don't. We don't. We don't. We have. We don't have everything. We have everything that we need to make it work, make things work. But we don't have a base of mikdash. 
we don't, in fact, we talked about can you begin to bring carbonyl without making the question. I told you, we're not quite sure where every piece, where every item is. Well, we, have, we, have, we, have, we have written here, we have written in Sefi Yekeskel, we have the Mishnayot, but still there's questions how exactly to build it. So once the, once the Bet HaMikdash is built and we have a Kohen Gadol, how will he know how to say the name? So we assume that certain things will be restored to us by Hashem or by Eliyahu or by prophets and so forth. You're right. So these are all questions. How will we how will we rebuild the Beit Mikdash if we don't know exactly where where it is down to the last millimeter? You can't just decide to put up a, a building like you will find a tract of land and say I want to put up a building this way, and I want to add a floor and I want to turn the the entrance on the side instead of the front. Hold on here. The oral laws were passed down from father to son. Why can you Correct. Correct. This was not passed down. No. How can we pass it down? But people heard the Kohen Gadol. Correct. But it fell to this use. I just find that hard to believe. I'm sorry. Everything else was passed down, but they heard it. They didn't pass it down to their kids? Over 2,000? No. They passed this down? They passed what down? Everything we're reading is passed down from thousands of years. But actually you see that it's not because even the Ramban and the Ibn Ezra disagree about what the Urim Vatumim are. You see, it's not that clear. When things don't happen, when things are not done actively... And they're only studied intellectually. You tend to have a lot of different opinions. But we know that the name of Hashem has so many letters and everything else. Okay. I think we're, we're the there are names. different. There are different names. There are different names. Right. Correct. 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 But all I'm saying is what the Ramban is saying is this name, which I guess probably would have to say would may have, may have was written in the Yud Hey and Vav and Hey. Maybe that was the name that was put in there. But how it's pronounced, I don't know. So it's not even clear when the Ramban is saying what the name is. This was, but whatever it was, it was the name of Hashem that was put there. That's why I said the Ramban is more simple compared to Ibn Ezra, but it's much more complex because we don't know how to define exactly what the name was. It was the Shem HaMaforosh. Okay? Um, the, uh, the Zohar actually says, and the Zohar actually makes it more complex, the Zohar says that the Urim Vitumim are not what we call the Yud Hei Vav and Hei, the, the Urim was a name that had 42 letters. The Tumim was a name of Hashem that had 72 letters. Okay, so now we don't know exactly what those names are. They were not used. So there are all kinds of spiritual and holy names of Hashem. So we, and, What's with the numbers? What does that represent? I don't know. Okay. Uh, I have to go to Hasidus for that. Right, well, yeah. so I, just, I have to go to Hasidus to learn Hasidus for that. But I want to say to that that we are not allowed to pronounce Hashem's name. So even though I heard it, I cannot pass it on to my children. That's right. Because I can't tell people. Right. I can't pronounce the name. The, um, the 42 na- letter name of Hashem, by the way, Jeff, is before Lachadodi. Before you sing Lachadodi, there's a paragraph on the Bachal Kedola Simincha. There are 42 letters in that paragraph. Some people say that's the name of Hashem, or that's actually a, some kind of way to remember the name of Hashem. But there are 42 letters. Count them up this Friday night. Tomorrow night, count them up. <laughs> that's a good point, then. That's a very good point. Right, that's why that, but that's why they couldn't pass it on. That's a great point. Okay. But there are, once again, things... Here. Let me kind of digress for one half a minute. And I'm going to pull myself right back. We talked about Tchelis once upon a time. Yes. Right? I have tchelis, I have what I believe is tchelis on my tzitzis, on my, yes. not the tzitzis I wear here, the tzitzis on my talus. Um, one of the questions that was, that's been asked, not everybody accepts this, and the answer is because we lost the tradition. So we think we have tchelis, but, but we're never really quite sure. In other words, I, think, I believe it's tchelis, I believe everything that I've read about this, and everything I understand about this, and everything that they've discovered about this. However, the Mesora the actual unbroken tradition has been broken because this was lost. The factory stopped producing it. And for hundreds of years, nobody had tchelis until they began rethinking about this and rediscovering it in the 1700s and the 1800s. And the Rajin the Rebbe, Rav Hanach um, of Rajin, thought he had an idea how to do it. And he, may, he may not have been right. Other people had ideas. But the, 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 the link was broken. So, Hashem wants us to know Hashem, yet Hashem doesn't allow us to remember His name. It's kind of interesting. Well, it's actually so. It, it's so. There's a lot of mystery. There's a lot of mysteriousness about Hashem. That's actually the beauty of this religion. The fact that every the religions of the ancient world and even today needed a concrete symbol to look at. 
you can identify it, whether you're looking at Hindu or, you know, all of these, these Near East, Far Eastern religions, or even indigenous religions, or even Christianity. You need to have someone hanging up there that you can visualize. So that's a son of God, but it's still God. In our mind, we can't even understand what God is. It's an entity that you can't define. You can't even really ident- call God by God's ultimate name. We call, we call God Hashem. What does Hashem mean? The name. The name. Right? And what does it really represent? Aleph, Dalet, Nun, Yud. Which, by the way, itself is not really Hashem's name. It's simply what's Aleph, Dalet, Nun, Yud. Adon means master. He is the master. Master of the world. The master with a capital T-H-E. Right? Or even, even Yud, Hey, Vav, and Hey really represents what? Existence. Hover. Haya was in the past. Yehiyah is in the past. Right. So eternality. So all of the references to Hashem that we use, right? Elohim is a general name, by the way. Elokeinu is our God. That's a general name about deities. He's our deity. But we, you know the Torah talks about Elohim Acherim, of false gods, other gods. And everything that we talk about Hashem is about Hashem. We can't really put the finger onto it. And that's because... And that's be, I don't mean to point my finger at you. That's because, that's because, because understanding Hashem is a different dimension from what we live in. That's in the body. Right. So how close does the soul, I've read a bit, how close is the soul, Moshe, to Hashem? When, we, when the soul is living with the Shekhinah, what does that mean? Isn't it been said that the soul doesn't know where Hashem is even in, in, in okay. the body? Okay. Yes, correct. But the... the but the dimension is the dimension that Hashem is in, at least. It's a spiritual dimension. Let, let me say, well, let me kind of put it down this way. And, and you, you may or may not like this. You may or may not accept it fully. We live in a world of three dimensions. Right? How do we define three dimensions? Spatially. Right? Latitude, longitude, height, width, depth. Okay, there's a fourth dimension. What's the fourth dimension? What's the you fourth dimension? Time. Time. Time is usually the fourth dimension. What's the difference between the fourth dimension and between the other three dimensions? A lot of differences. Well, three dimensions, I can change my locus. I'm right here, I can walk up and sit at the other side of the base medrash. I have changed where I am in 3D. I can physically make that change. The fourth dimension is time. I can measure time. I can quantify time. I can tell you I'm going to meet you in one hour. I can tell I meet you tomorrow at this time, but I can't. But I can't change time. Time keeps moving along. I can't turn time backwards. I can change my locus in three dimensions. I can put myself anywhere on the globe. I went to Israel and I came back, but I can't go back in time and say I want to go back and visit that. So fourth dimension, I can visualize or I can quantify. I can't visualize it. I can't see time. I can quantify it, but I have no power over it. Spirituality is a fifth dimension. I don't want to make it sound so simple. It's not that simple. But it's a fifth dimension. I can't even begin to understand how to quantify it. Time, I can't see. I can see where I am here. I can find myself on a Google map. And if I have a GPS, it's going to put me right here. But I, but I can move and I can control that. Fourth dimension, I can't control, but I can quantify. The fifth dimension is so different from anything else that I can't even quantify it, but it's because I can't even begin to understand and comprehend it. Because I can only think in three or four D. But maybe the fifth, not maybe the fifth dimension is not in this universe, Moshe. It's outside it's of not, this universe. Correct. It's in a different dimension. Yeah, it's outside the. Universe. I'm not sure outside the, the universe is. Well, the universe, the universe is, is material. Yeah, right. So it's material. So it can. It, it's not only means outside of it. It can be in a different way. Time is here. Time is in the same dimension as 3D. Don't tell me the fourth dimension of time is in a different universe. Well, time is also... Time Ex- is different on Earth than just in, in, in space. Okay, correct. But time is still here, except I just can't quantify it. So it's a different kind of dimension. Now, all the science fiction movies are about what going back in time or going ahead in time, because that's science fiction. You can't go back in time. You can't go ahead in time. You can't turn the clock back. Right, the older you get, you say, "I can't, I can't do, I can't do things over. I can't go back to when I was when a kid." You gotta accept time where you are. So, so spirituality, you recognize Hashem as a fifth dimension. Right. Okay. That That's makes sense. Good. Yeah. Then we can go ahead. Actually, I think we can go ahead in time. We can't go back. We can go ahead with a very high speed. We can go ahead. Relative relativity, we can go in the space very high speed. Come back. There'll be more time has passed here. Absolutely. So, we, be, so we went ahead in time. We'll be a thousand years old. You could be six days old. Right, correct. So Schroeder, Schroeder writes about this. Yeah. Gerald Schroeder writes yeah, about this. Yeah. Correct. Okay, but true. So there are ways to manipulate time, but right here I can't. No. Okay, great. 
Okay, back back here. Because I'm going to do this. We'll take a break and then we'll get to um, the Sivas Shalom. So what is this? So the Shem Amaforosh. And therefore, and therefore it's going to be folded over. Uh, why does it have to be folded over? Be, uh, because it says, uh, I'm not sure why. And why do I know that I'm right? Says the Ramban. Because nowhere in the work of the artisans who are making all the utensils and items for the, for the garments or for the utensils of the Mesa Mikdash, does it talk about making in the Urim Vitumim? The uh, Benayas would talk about building some kind of contraption that would help you kind of divine things. No, it's not there. There's no command how to make them. There's no action how to make them. And in all the other garments it says, They made the ephod. They made the breastplate. The breastplate was real. But it doesn't say, doesn't say they made the Urim Vitumim. If it had been something that was made physically of wisdom, a wise thing to make, if it's so wise to make, like the Ibn Ezra said, that they could use it to divine some kind of contraption, it should have said how to make it. And if we did want to tell it to us exactly how to make it because it was so complex, it should, Torah should have said, It should have written uh, that they, you should make them in the ways that were written on the mountain. So in other words, either it should have written and told us how to make them, it should have said to him, make them the way that I told you how to make them, the way that I, did, that I didn't record in here, but make them out of gold or silver. The other, the other proof that Ramban says, I know I'm right, because no other utensil is called with the hay, the, the item. This is called Ha'urim Vaturim, Shlom Nisgur Klau. Of all it says, it says, Vyasura, make an ark. Vyasu Shukhan, make a table. Vyasu Menorah Tahar, make a menorah. And all of them. And in Mishkan, the actual tabernacle says, There's a Mishkan Taset. It says, The Mishkan you're going to make. Why? Because it's mentioned to what was said, Make a Mishkan before. Vyasuli Mikdash. But otherwise, all the other writers are make an item itself. So what was this all about? So therefore writes the Ramban what he said before. So he says, put them into the, it doesn't say make them, it says put them into the Choshim Mishpat, the fold that you saw before. It doesn't say how to make them. It uses the, the, the Urim Vitorim. It only is told to Moshe to make, to put them in. You, Moshe, put them into the Choshim Mishpat. When he made them, it says later on in the in beginning of Parshat Vayek, Row where they actually invest the Kohanim. Vaitain el achoshen et Torim v'tum tumim. The Moshe puts into the breastplate the Urim v'tumim. Kilohaya masum and it's not being built. Moshe simply has them on a parchment. Vlohaya lo manim vlo lekaiso be maisiv lo no davar klal. They had nothing. The rest of the people had nothing to do with it. But what? I will name sod masur lo Moshe mi piag vuro. It's a secret of how to write this name. This is a very holy name that was not entrusted to people, and that's why we lost it. That Moshe was given by Hashem how to write it. Vuhuk tavam b'kedushi wrote the holiness. Oh, how you masi shemayim? Well, they were written by heaven and given to Moshe to insert. V'lachach eskem stam uvidiak moveishkein meken leganeden et akruvim et akruvim. The same way that it says the um, when when God throws out Adam and Eve and he puts in to watch the Garden of Eden. It says he put there hakruvim the cherubs the angels means these were made by God. So if it says the urim v'tumim, it means that these were given to Moshe to do or were given by Hashem directly to Moshe itself. So how do they do them? So what do, how do they work itself? So it says the Ramban, I'm sorry, I skipped the line. V'nei Moshe l'kach katev v'alubim v'atumim v'nicham sham b'chosh mishpat achrei shel bishet aron o'ifod v'achoshen. Right, so Moshe takes the urim v'atumim and he puts them into the, um, to the, to the eifod n'choshen, as it says, v'yitain alav v'atayifod v'achos v'achoshen ha'ifod. And he puts the urim, the choshen, etc., 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 etc. He puts them into the folds. V'inyan hu, I'm going to move to the last line here. These were holy names of Hashem. They would light up when the Kohen would ask to try to understand certain words and try to understand what I was really trying to say. Um, and Vamashal, and here it is. 
And this is what we saw in the footnote before in the art school. When he asked, in the beginning of Shoftim, when they asked, who should be the first, which, which, which tribe should go first to try to, to ensure it can take its territory. So the coin, he would, the coin would think about how to set up the letters, the words in the Urim. So he saw the following letters light up. The words, the whole, the whole name of Yehuda lit up. The Yud from the word of Levi lit up. The Ayin from Shimon lit up. The Laman from Levi lit up. And the Hay from Avraham lit up, which it says on the bottom, Avraham Yitzhak and Yaakov. HaKatuv Shom al Das Ravotenu O Shiyu Pamachert Negede Nav Heyam Yehuda. So the, there were different letters which lit up, and, the, and either the hay was from Avraham, or maybe the hay from Yehuda lit up a second time. And these were, appeared to be random, random flashing off. However, when the coin saw them, he didn't know how to arrange them. From the words, from the letters which he was going to put together later, Yehuda, Yud, Hey, Vav, Dalet, Hey, Yale, Yud, Ayin, Lamed, Ayin, you could scramble together different words. You could have made different words as well, not only Yehuda, Yale, you could have made Hoi, Hod, Oleha. Um, the echo of woe is coming out, something like that. Or the echo of woe, of woe, like woe and alas is coming out. Or har hai al yidahet. Or the lamentations are on maybe Yehuda. Or something like that. Now, it didn't have to be Yehuda Yale. There could be lamentations on Yehuda. There could be lamentations on all of us. The way to scramble the letters are going to be very different. There was another holy set of letters. The second name of Hashem enabled the coin to scramble and unscramble them and put them in the right order. He was the, the two letters or the two names of Hashem gave him this divine inspiration to know how to put together, together the letters themselves. And so that's really basically how the Urim Vitumim actually worked. Um, and, the actually in the, and this is really what it was. So the two things that go on, um, the really the two things that go on is that the, the Kohen was actually able to see the letters. So first of all, people couldn't see it. Only the Kohen Gadol could see them. The only he got to see them. Which letters lit up, and then he had to figure out how to scramble the letters together. So the second name of Hashem gave him inspiration how to know how to set them up the letters. So even getting the letters could could be, could not give the full answer. I'm thinking of the Enigma machine. I don't know the Enigma machine. No, the, 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 the uh, code machine that the Nazis use. Ah, uh-huh. I don't know that. Oh, it's a fascinating. Oh, the Enigma machine. No, what is it? Oh, you have to read the book. <laughs> yeah, it's it's a, a, like an extremely extremely complex code that that is scrambled going in scrambled and scrambled going, out. going out and uh, like it, it, you had you had to have a machine the actual machine yeah. physical machine to decipher the yeah. codes right. yeah. and the, the Brits got their hands on different lights and going I like it and the Brits got their hands on look it up it, you I should see a parallel so we don't even see that there because encryption is all electronic we don't even understand how the bits and bytes yeah. are really set up. But that's the same thing. The encryption is a very complex encryption, or not encryption. Enigma machine. I'm going to look it up. And how they, how they, the Allies broke it? Because breaking the Enigma machine was one of the keys. Call breakers. And how they break it? Uh, it was done in Bletchley Park in London, and it was some very uh, amazingly smart people who spent a lot of time doing it. And they captured one, one copy from a, a sub. But they, they didn't allow the they, they hid the fact that they captured it from the Nazis. So the Nazis never knew right, that they, that they had, had it. It's, it's an incredible story. But, uh, <laughs> but there you go. <laughs> but the, the bottom line is right. The bottom line is the bottom line is you had to know how to put the letters together. Right, you had to know how to put the letters together. Um, it's it's one thing to know what the letters are. That was one level. The second was not how to put them together. Uh, the Vilna Gaon points out in commenting on the Ramban. The Vilna Gaon says that when when uh, when at the beginning of Sefer Shmuel, so um, they go to um, Elkanah has two wives, Penina and Hannah. 
And Hannah wants to have a child. She's she's infertile, yeah. right? And she comes to the she comes to the Mishkan and she's praying there. And Ellie sees her. Ellie the Kohen sees her and he says to her, he's "You drunk. know, do you think she's drunk? she thinks she's drunk." Yeah. So so the Vilna Gaon says, "I understand. Ellie a Kohen should have been able to have access. He's the Kohen God wearing all his stuff. He should have known what how to, what she, what's going on here." So the Vilna Gaon says, "Well, he really didn't understand the lights that popped on. So the lights that popped on were Chaf Shin Yud Reish Hey." So he read it, Kaf Shin Yud Reish Hey. He read it as Shikora, Shin Kaf Yud Reish Hey. It really was written Kishera. Uh, okay, and in fact, then this is based upon what Chana says to Eli Cohen. Eli says to him, "Why are you like you know, put away your drink?" And she says, "You know what I'm saying? Ani Yishok Shera, Ani. I'm a Kishera. You you got the, you, you you really are not really a good Cohen. You don't know how to unscramble. You don't have the real Ruach Hakodesh. You only got half it right." Because in other words, it's not you, you're just not you're just not really worthy of a coin with all the truth was saying to him. And the whole story, by the way, of Ellie is a story of his kids aren't raised properly, and the, and he's and the, there's a lackadaisical approach going on in the whole base of Mikdash. And Shmuel comes along, and that's why he's raised in the, in the not the base of Mikdash, the Mishkan, and he begins to change that as things go through. They make him the Navi, and people turn to him. But that's that's really the second. So the Ramban is saying the first one was the Urim. And the two, and these were two special names of Hashem, which once again, we don't know which what they were, right? Was it what we call the Yud, Hey, and the Vav, and the Hey, or was it something more like 42, 72 letters, 42 letters and 72 letters that the Zohar talks about, and what were those names? But but having, wearing those letters, and how did they impact upon the coin? How does simply wearing those letters simply go back to him? So once again, this goes back to a person who's obviously meant to be on a high spiritual level, that he can engage in HaKadosh Baruch Hu's communications from HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Was there sound or just light? It was just light. And the light... How would he see it? How would he see it? Unless he had a mirror in front of him. Well, I guess, yeah, yeah, I guess he had a, I guess he had a big, big pipic. I don't know. I was thinking about that two minutes ago. <laughs> but it would be not only upside letters. down, but... Uh... Yes, exactly. <laughs> Why was Ellie chosen as Kohen Gadol? Why was he? I guess he had the potential to be a Kohen Gadol. I guess he, he had the potential. We all have potentials. I know, but he's chosen. Yeah. Okay. His mistake was later on because right. he didn't correct his sons. Correct. So, so maybe he started. Spine. Maybe he started out as a good as a being proper, and so the, in other words, when you see he did, he was not completely wrong. He got the letters, he just didn't fully know how to put them together. Right. Once again, it's not about by my, it's not about my trying to figure out a puzzle. Like uh, what is this hangman where you kind of put up letters one after the other? You got to yeah, figure out where to right, put them. Right. It's not about jumble, just being jumble. clever enough how to unjumble the letters. It's about getting the Ruach Hakodesh to unjumble the letters. So all thing is very mysterious. That's why I say the the uh, the Ramban is uh, the Ramban is cl- clearer, more simple, but less simple than um, than than um, than the Ibn Ezra. But this is what the Ramban says. Usually, usually what a lot of the Mafarshim say, which is usually what we understand to be the Ramban to me. Okay, take a five minute break, and then we gotta do some to see Shalom. Um, yeah. I'm gonna have to leave uh, Okay. Oh, before, so before you leave, just about Monday. M- Monday, Monday, the, ba- the, the base oh, yeah, is having a special course. program. Okay, I'd like to fold into it. The program actually begins at 9.15 is breakfast. I'll send you an email later yeah. today. 9.15 is breakfast, 9.45 there is time to repair, and at 10.30 oh, it's, 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 it's a family day kind of thing. So I'll send you the flyer. Um, we, with the preparation we can do together, we'll listen to the share. Just wanted to be, you'll be aware when you'll see it, then you can figure out how you want to handle it. Okay. Uh, so so what time is uh, the breakfast? No, breakfast is 9.15. No, I actually have a meeting Monday morning. Okay. Smoke sound? Is everybody else coming to breakfast? Yeah. I'm sorry? I would love to. Should I count you in for breakfast? Uh, count me in for the second half of breakfast. I'm coming from Dershu. Okay. So, uh, save me bagel. Okay. When is the uh, What time is the Is there a minion here? I don't know. I don't, don't know. I don't okay, think so. Okay, what's your opinion on... Let's see what's shalom. She had chatoim, There's some sins impact more than they're physical. And some sins are not really physical sins. They're more just spiritual values. Yeshna ma'virot mamash. Here's the example. Some are real sins. Kashere yetzaram et kaber aladam v'chotei b'gufo. The yetzahara gets a hold of me and I can't fight it off. And it, it defeats me and I sin. I slip into it. Now that's physical. Viosi masi asum. I do things that are wrong to do. They're incorrect. But then there's something else. Viyesh begamei neshama binyanei. There are diff- there are chinks in my neshama binyanei kadesh atzmecha b'mutalach to sanctify yourself even if it's permitted to do something. I can eat everything that's kosher, but if, eat, if I eat it as a glutton, I really haven't done the right thing. I can make all the brachas, but if I really not, if I just kind of chomp away, I don't really understand what I'm doing. 
So there are Dvarim Shatoralo Asatamba Ferush al Shem bin Igud la Tachlichu Gdoshim Tiu ki Gdosh Nashal Khim. The things are not really wrong. They're not erroneous, but they're just not, they're not the good Torah values. They're not good Jewish values. And therefore, our Torah marriage, our Tachlit Shuyudi Shuyudavuk Bashemit Barach. We should be connected to Hashem. And everything we do, we should think about Hashem. V'yalken Kedoshim Tiyu Ki Kedoshani. Mizbeach HaKetor Hayom Yuchad HaTachlit Shuyudi Kedoshim Tiyu. Therefore, this, this altar that's mentioned in the end is about sanctifying myself that even when I do things that are correct, I should think about what I'm doing bring closer to Hashem. That I should think about to correct the values that I could have done. I'm doing things that are okay, but I'm not doing them with the right intention. I'm wearing talis and tefillin, I'm davening, and I'm saying all the words, but I'm really not thinking about tefillah. So that reminds me, Marsha, a person has an unholy thought. Is that considered an avera? That's considered, That's considered a pagam in your neshama. That's what he's saying. That's exactly what he's saying. And you know what? And that's a harder, harder thing to recognize. It's Navera. because it doesn't. Because it's not black and white, right? It's not black and white. But in other words, when I think bad things to do, that's a spiritual value. I mean, somewhere, somewhere within me, I'm still. I haven't really conquered my Yitzhahara. Yeah. So I've got the Yitzhahara in a corner, but it's still bubbling up. Yeah. That's what he's trying to say. Yeah. And we all fight that. So we fight. We fight both fights. We fight the, fight the physical fight, and we also fight the the value fight. Right? I went to you know you daven. I said I went to davening, okay? But I'm I'm thinking about the, the deal I've got coming down in an hour and a half. I'm here, but I'm not here. Exactly. Now that's not a radical thing about a bad thought, but there are a lot of things that could be a lot worse, right? But we all know what we are, what we what we think about, and what we could be. But that's exactly the point. It's less well defined, so I can do everything right, but I'm really not. I'm really not into it. You can break that across all the boundaries, whether it's you know eating, drinking, uh, relationships, business, prayer, etc. We all have the fight we're doing both in the actions and in the attitudes and character traits and um, thinking. I also have to clarify here. I think if I go buy a restaurant or something. Then smell the shrimp or something and I'm thinking what oh, this shrimp was, used to be very good yeah or how good this uh, could be right yes that's not that's not uh, Vera uh, no the moment I say I think maybe I should go eat. the moment I say that you know what I'm not going to eat but I really wish I could be eating and uh, it depends like I'm saying I should be you know I, li- I like this stuff but I'm not eating it because I'm subserving to Hashem that's okay right your but, thought is I really want to eat that. Right. Like deep, deep down. I no, really if I have the, 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 the I'm saying, I'll, make, I'll go. I'll go and eat. You know, but I don't do it in the end. But I, you know, I, I hear you. Right. There was a moment. That's there. the fight. That's the fight that's we all there, have. There. That's the fight we're having. So yeah. that will be. Gone. That's like something that's not. Right. In other words, and it's more than that. It's even the attitude. In other words, I'm really happy I can't eat shrimp. As opposed to stupid religion that doesn't let me eat the shrimp, I, but like I bought into the religion, so I got I got to go through with this, right? Right. Um, oh, is that true? Right. I, I you know what? I I don't like fasting. I've said this. I I I find that I find fast days are very difficult, and they surely don't get easier as you get older, right? So I, I you know I I I find I find that I have that Yates Sahara saying to me not to eat Yaris, but you know Yaris, you don't really appreciate this. And I'm never, I'm never going to run out in the middle of Yom Kippur and get myself a sandwich. But I still say to myself, you know what, Yaris, I bet you could dive a lot better if you were eating a good meal. <laughs> if you could take off 20 minutes and go just get a, you know, a couple of cups of coffee and a couple of good danishes, you can come back and really dive better. So that's the fight. That's the fight I'm having. That's, now, there's nothing wrong, right? I'm just saying, it's, I'm not being Mekadesh. I'm not being Mekadesh myself with that kind of thought. Or even when I eat, when I'm eating, here, let's take it a different perspective. I'm eating. Am I, do I live to eat or do I eat to live? You, you eat to live. Right. Of course, of course. But there's some people who live to eat, and even if they're eating everything that's kosher, 100% glot, super glot kosher, yeah. but if they're living to eat, so that's not doing things correctly. That's, there's nothing wrong. It's not a black and white Aveira. Right? But that's what it means you're not makadesh bumutalacha. You're not sanctifying that which is permissible. But there, nowadays, there, uh, or, I don't know if there are any, you know, there's anybody who eats to 
Lee. But I'll tell you what. But, 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 look, let, why don't I, why don't I talk to you? Why don't I talk to me? When I make the bracha, all right, when I, one thing is, do I make a bracha? Don't I make a bracha? Do I forget to make a bracha? Do we forget to make a bracha? Let's assume I make a bracha. Am I saying the bracha? Am I really thinking what the bracha really means? Thank you, Hashem, who brought Motzi Lech Menorah. You, you, God, brought the bread out of the ground. Before I eat the bread, I got to recognize it's not the, it's not Sobeys, it's not the bakery, it's not my money that bought the bread. You created the ability for the bread to grow. You decided that wheat is going to become a type of thing that will make into bread. Hashem, shall call me a bit varam before I take a drink. Here we got a cup of coffee. Everything you made according to your word, you created the world. When I'm eating, therefore, and when I'm drinking, I'm not only drinking because I enjoy the drink, because it gives me benefit, because it gives me pleasure, because I enjoy a good cup of coffee that's still black. It's really telling me I'm serving the Almighty. You know that everything you say is logical. It's, it's like when you really think deeply about what we're saying here, it's completely logical. Thank Hashem, have great, be grateful, be appreciative, wake up, and it doesn't matter what's happening in life, be grateful, but look at the fight. That's right. In a way, the Torah wants to create superhumans. No, in the way the Torah wants us to fight the fight. In the way the Torah wants us to have that battle and challenge Super every day. spiritual humans. No, every, every person has the challenge that we have every day to kind of continue that battle. You never finish the battle. You yeah, never. It's a tough battle. Okay? My goodness. It's like trying to beat the odds in the stock market. You can't just simply put the stocks away if you want to beat the odds. You, you know what? You can play it safe and put something away and come back. And if you put it in a stock place, a safe place, maybe you'll come back in two, you know, a couple of months and it's where it's supposed to be. But if you really want to beat the odds, you've got to kind of be on top of it. That's what the Torah says. If you really want to kind of win the battle, you've got to be on this every day. You never finish. Yeah. That's a kind of depressing kind of thing, but it's really what we are. Why? Because the Almighty created us. We're part, of, we're part physical and we're part spiritual. So that's what. So the, so the first part of the Ramban talked about the fact that you had. The first part of the Siva Shalom talked about the fact that there's a spiritual and there, there, there's physical types of things in terms of what the sin does. The first part that he read talked about every kind of sin actually is going to have a physical impact and a spiritual impact. The second part that he writes now he says there, there are different types of things that you do that may not even be classified as sins. They're more attitudinal approaches. And that makes them closer to being a spiritual deficiency. It's not a physical deficiency. You didn't do anything wrong. You're just not thinking the right things. So the so last parsha, and this week and the next three or so, have to do with measurements and cubits and yeah. stuff like that. Right. So because every word counts in the Torah and everything matters, we know this. What is cubits? What is what is us knowing how many cubits something was do for us? What's the relevance? What's the spiritual relevance that we know a certain measurement? Why do I need to know something was one and a half cubits? What does that do for my well, life? Um, in case I want to build a base of Mikdash? I, we may not know why everything is in the Torah. Mm-hmm. Correct? No, we don't. Right. But so there's a practical reason just to know how to build the Mishkan or how to build a base of Mikdash when we need to know how to build it as best as we can. Uh, there are there are commentaries that talk about the values of um, halves. Yes, there's some some of the utensils are built with full measurements, full cubits, so many half cubits. Half means I need to I still need to work on it. I forget who talks about this. Uh, I think all of the cubits of the ark are in halves because it's never complete until you actually invest yourself in it. I mean, there are all kinds of interpretations. And but the do the same thing. What he wears, the stones for the future, well, so the people know for the future. What needs to Correct, be but also once again to understand that you are, you are well, this goes back to what we just did about the Kohen Gadol's clothing, the real clothing of the internal clothing, as we talked about from the Malbo, when right. the Ramban, the Kohen Gadol is considered like a prince, the real prince is the serving God. Sure. Not about the not about the Achashverosh prince's kings. Okay? And so Meshach also puts every, put things in perspective so you can picture them and you can relate to them. You, you can't start, have the Besamik Dash if you don't have a picture of what how this looks like or Right, but but Jeff is asking, what? How does it help me today? The to answer is so to not everything needs to help me on every day. Not every law applies every day. Not every law applies to every person. Not every law applies in every 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 situation. There is no one who can do tired mitzvah six thirteen commandments. 
There is no one. There never was. Some commandments are only for when there's a base of Mikdash. Some commandments are only in Israel. Some commandments are only outside of Israel. Some commandments are only for Kohanim. Some only for Levis, right? So the only way you ever do 613 is when everybody does them all together. Okay. So, not, so, so, but, so it may not be the lesson for me, per se. It may be for the Jewish people in general. So the Mizbeach Zad is, is close to the Torah because... I haven't hit that answer yet. Okay. okay, I haven't hit that answer. Okay, but, so, but, the, but you're saying, or he's saying that that the the Katoris is about is a spiritual, about a way to create, about a way something. to purify a person spiritually. In the same way that bringing carbonate were a way to create expiation physically. So this is about to create expiation spiritually, which either means one of two things. He said, just said two things. They're very similar, but they're different. The first thing he said that any avera you do also has a spiritual implication on your soul. Now he's saying something else. There are items we do that are 100% kosher yosher, but something is wrong with them, right? Like I can drive within the speed limit, but I can still be a poor driver. Is that even break, you know, I guess that, that's not a good example because I'd be breaking the law by being a reckless driver or something. So, in other words, but there's something inherently wrong. And the example he's actually going to give, let's just skip down to the bottom of this page, last, last line before you turn over. Um, like, if you want to appear before the king, you smell, you have a poor smell, you have poor body odor. So you, I don't know, you work in a, you're a farmer, you, and you smell from manure. So you holy um, You can dress properly to meet the king, but if you smell like, you know, if you go into a barn, you smell like manure. You smell like manure. You smell poorly. You can't appear before the king. There's nothing. What'd you do wrong? You really took a, you took a, you, I don't know, you kind of dressed properly, you took a shave, you took a haircut. But even though the smell that you have is not something you can put your finger on, you can't approach the king, you can't come into the king's presence if you just smell really poorly, it's just not proper. So the same thing is going to be when it comes to coming close to the Almighty. Even things that you do that are heter, that are mutar, that are not sinful, they smell bad. Like you know, I give the example saying bracha. I think about a bracha. And I'm not sure what bichinat nirgan mafrid aluf means. This is what the ktor says. She mitok kol kli hamagim mishkan she yosim latar yudin she yashuv liot tavuk b'shem among all the utensils that we use in the Beit Mikdash in the Mishkan to set to purify the Jew to returning it close to Hashem. Hayam mizbech ktor she yonei ruach ruach nichol Hashem. The mizbech ktor was the one that made you smell nice. Shu davar ruchni. That's a spiritual thing. Lachaper apagamim hadakim begin pigmein neshama. It's to correct. The chinks, the deficiencies in your neshama that are so small that you can't identify. And to correct the poor smell, the poor spiritual smell that comes from you. Therefore, every day they brought spices to bring forgiveness for the Jewish people. Even if a person that was never a Jew did a sin. But just thinking about the sins, or just having these poor thoughts is something we can never fully escape. And therefore, he says, And that's why it's called, the very end of, this, of, the, of the chapter, it calls it Kodesh Kodashim. The inner mizbeach, which the spices are born, is called Kodesh Kodashim. To bring to the purpose of the Jew, which is Kedusha. How do you become sanctified? You can do things that are permissible and yet not be a holy person. You can simply, I told you, you can fress a whole day and just make the bra- and make sure the food is kosher, but you're really not thinking about Hashem. You'll be to me a holy people, a kingdom of priests and a holy people. You'll be a holy people to me. So the Mizbech HaKtaris is to bring us to the highest level of Kedoshim. And that's, by the way, why it's going to be opposite the Aron Kodesh, which is really what the Kodesh Kodashim is all about. I'm not sure you answer that question, right? 
So why is this at the very end of the whole story? Why is it the last thing that's put in here? This is the last column on the right side, last paragraph on the right side. But the very end, they saved it for the end, not because it was forgot to put it in, but it was because it's the best. This is the highest level, the final end point of making yourself purify. Because what do you got to do first? First you got to cleanse the outer. And then you got to cleanse the outer part of the inners. And only when you can clean the outside can you get underneath it. Like saying, you first you got to clean off the gross dirt, then you got to clean off the dirt that's below it, then you got to clean off the level below that. So you got to work from the outside in. First, the Torah writes in Parsha Truma, the utensil of the Mishkan, which which sang, which which cleanses us from externally and even a bit internally. Only after you got the whole Mishkan and all the garments that are set up and everything else, you come to the Mizbech and Torah, Shumam Shir Kedusha Yisrael Atar Pnimiyot Shem Pnimiyot Yenashoah to sanctify the internal, internalness of the Jew. That we've done everything right. We're doing what we're supposed to be doing, but somewhere in the back of our mind, I'm really thinking about whether I really want to do this. I really want to get that sandwich on Yom Kippur. I'm not going to go get the sandwich, but I'm fighting the battle about that thought that has inserted its mind. I'm trying to daven Shimon Esri, and guess what? In the middle of the bracha, suddenly I find I'm on a different page. Because something inserted itself in my mind to pull me out. I said all the words, but I didn't really think about what I'm saying. Therefore the Torah comes to explain this holy high level on the holy Mizbeach and Zahav. This is the Mizbeach and Torah. To become holy, sanctified. So sanctify yourself, not just do away with the minimal level, just think about how we can get close to Hashem. So therefore it's opposite the ark. Mashain came with Shulchan of Menorah, vis a vis the Shulchan, the table, and the Menorah, which were on the sides of the holy. Venemar Bolof Ne Parochan, and it's before the Parochan, then before the Kaporat, Kim is Becha Ktor, who Kodesh Kudoshim, it's got the sanctity of the holiest levels, which is equivalent to what the Ark is. Vahaya Baita Bo, the Chinat, Haharak, Dusha, Ha Shaykh, and the Shema. This is the. Um, the spirituality levels coming down from on high, which is really from the Shema, Shehu Chelek Eloki Mamal. This is the spiritual value from God from on top who comes down to us. The same way the Ark is the representative of God's spirit coming down, so too doing this Mizbech HaKtor it is. Okay, so far so good. Good so far? One more piece. So what does this have to do with the menorah? So why did the, the, the Torah tell us that when Aaron comes to clean out the menorah, he's going to put and light the spice, the spices onto the Mizbech Akhtoris? What does one have to do with the other? So the, so the, the Siva Shalom says that the menorah is not really about just light. The menorah is really about a spiritual light. Lighting the menorah is a representative of the fact that the light of Hashem is really given to the Jewish people. HaKadosh Baruch Hashina is burning brightly. The Siva Shalom doesn't say it here, he says it earlier on in one of the earlier paces, that when HaKadosh Baruch Hu made the world, he created a primordial light. And the primordial light, which is Vayer Vayvoki Yom Echad, right? He are, God said, let there be light. This light is not only that physical light which existed before there was a sun, it was a spiritual light. What happens to the light that was made on the first day of creation? Before I read this part about the Mizbech and Torah, what happened to the first light, to the first day of creation? Ganus. He was Ganus, he hid it. Why did God hide the light? He hid it for the Tzaddikim in the end of the time. Why did he hide it for Tzaddikim? Because it's really about spiritual values. And that's why Aaron is the one who's going to light the menorah. The menorah is not about bringing physical light. The menorah is about bringing spiritual light, recognizing the spiritual values of the what HaKadosh Baruch gives to us. That's why on Shabbos, what do we do? We light. This is what Nesiva Shalom, we're going to light candles for Shabbat. What about, the rest of, what about the rest of the days of the week? We don't have Shabbat. So we have actually, we had seven branches of the menorah. All these other six branches face towards the center branch. So the other six days of the week get that spiritual value, the reflection of the light of HaKadosh Baruch Hu, which we keep on Shabbat. We don't have a base of Mikdash, but the spiritual value, which is re- and, that, and that is really remaining for the spiritual light of HaKadosh Baruch Hu. The same way the menorah in the Mishkan is really reflective and, res- and talking about the spiritual value of HaKadosh Baruch Hu coming into this world. Therefore, it says Nesiv HaShalom, and we introduce this, now read this, that twice a day, 
twice a day, they kind of reflected upon the spiritual level of the Jewish people. They did items, they did acts in the, Mish- in the Mishkan that were meant to create expiation for the spiritual and the Shema of the Jewish people. In the morning, well, let's start the other way around. In the evening, when the Kohen Gadol would come in, he would light the menorah. The menorah is not about physical light, it's not about energy light, it's about spiritual light. And what's the spiritual light? The menorah is meant to therefore create kapara for the Jewish people, for the neshama concept once again, the spiritual values. Not that we did something wrong. For doing something wrong physically, you have a mizbeach where you brought the outside, the external mizbeach, you brought different karbonot. Right? The menorah is about being inside the, 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 the mishkan itself, and it's about light which is not physical. Once again, the same way that smelling is not physical, it's ethereal, light is also not physical. We, call, we know light is not physical because it's energy. It's an exothermic reaction. It's giving off light. It's giving off heat. Right? But it's really also telling you it's not matter. It's not physical. Light is not physical. <coughs> So, it was, so if it's not physical, it's going to be a representative as close as we can represent to spirituality. So that's the light of the menorah is representing the spiritual attempt to create expiation for what the neshama is being impacted on our sins. And now, that's at night. In the morning, the Kohen Gadol, now the light has gone out. The Kohen Gadol comes to clean out the menorah. And at the same time, what does he do? He lights the incense, which is going to create, once again, whatever happened in the last 12 hours, that the Jewish people may, may not have been perfect in their shamas, it's now created expiation for them. Okay, so let's read that last paragraph. The connection of the Mizbech and Ketores to the menorah itself. When they would light the menorah, when he would clean out the menorah in the morning, he would light the ketores. When Aaron would light the menorah at night, um, uh, he would clean. He would light, take out the menorah. The menorah was meant to bring to enlighten the Jewish people with the light of Hashem. And with the sanctity, to create sanctity or purity, the Jew has to bring the light of Hakadosh Baruch Hu down. Stuck in darkness, you can't see the spiritual inner light of Hashem. Then it's hard to become tahar. Al Kain, Hachanal Avodat Aktor Daitav Masya Menorah. So first thing you got to do is you got to bring light into the Mishkan to set the stage to bring the Torahs, which will bring the final level of purity. Mishdein Yonim Elu Matzino Shaita Avodat Muyichadil Laboker V'Laharav. And in both these things, you had an evening and a morning and an evening. But Menorah Kativ. In the menorah it says, Baboka Beit Yivot in the Eros. In the morning they clean the menorah. And Ubalot Aron at the Eros, Ben Abayim, you lit the menorah at night. V'chein Ketores, V'chein Aktorat Aktorat Taita Baboka Ba'arev. And they would light the Ketores also in the morning, and they light the Ketores also in the evening. They lit it twice a day. Shu'adat Amram Zala, Kabana Tamesha, Tamesha Shachar Mechapel Averot Shibin Laila, Tamesha Ben Abayim Kipel Averot Shoyom. He's saying as follows. He's saying there were two daily sacrifices that were brought. Every day, daily sac, daily tummy sacrifices. One in the morning, one late in the afternoon. The reason why you have two sacrifices to cover the fact that if the Jewish people did something wrong, you brought in the communal sacrifice in the morning. What about the second half of the day? They did something wrong in the next twelve hours. At the end of the daytime, in the, in the, late in the mincha time, they would bring the Qataris ben Abayim. He's quoting from some, some, I think, his own opinion. So he says, the same way there were two daily sacrifices, they're going to light, therefore the menorah, do two things with the menorah, and two things with the ketores. You lit the menorah at night, you cleaned it out in the morning. You lit the ketores in the morning, the spices in the morning, and you also lit them again in the evening when you lit the menorah. So you're always constantly rotating to make sure for the last 12 hours that nothing is wrong and you can purify the, the souls. Show him a turn to me that you did by Boka Ba'arev. al zem ma'jigotam menorah me'yil yisrael the same way you had two daily sacrifices to cover each 12 hour period so too you have two actions with the menorah and two actions with the ketores two ketores morning and evening menorah in the evening and cleaning the menorah in the morning the whole idea of doing this is to sanctify and purify the Jewish people day and night I don't know what this abbreviation means. From the basic Avi wrote until the final smallest, different becoming smallest chinks in our neshama. So therefore, you did it twice and back and forth. So that's really about trying to 
trying to connect ourselves to our Kaddish Baruch Hu. So we want to really to do that. Uh, the the Nesim Shalom, by the way, points out that the world, that we don't have a base of Mikdash today. The Megamachi of Ner Tamid, since the previous piece, I'm going to just tell you very briefly some of what he says in the previous piece. The Megamachi of Ner Tamid equals Shabbos. 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 Huh. Ner Tamid equals the Gamachi of Shabbos, or is it actually Bishabbos, on Shabbos. So in other words, that even when we don't have a base of Mikdash, which lighting the menorah and bringing the Taurus is going to try to create a, a sense of sanctity about who we are, we have the Shabbos itself. So Shabbos takes the place, and that's the day that you can connect to Hashem. That's why I started to tell you before. So the Ner Tamid that we have is really by lighting the menorah on Shabbos, lighting the, the, uh, the Neros on Shabbos is able to bring that into our houses. And we, have, we, we take the rest of the week, we remember Shabbos, in order to create the glow of the menorah of the Shabbos candles to go the rest of the week. That's why the whole week we say Yom Rishon Shabbos, January Shabbos, Shlishi Shabbos, and so forth. So the whole purpose of the menorah is really to kind of the whole purpose of lighting Shabbos candles and having a Shabbos is to allow us to actually to increase ourselves and to raise our spiritual level itself. And this goes back to the R that HaKadosh Baruch made on the first day of the week, which was put aside at the end of that first Shabbos, because Shabbos is really a spiritual kind of value for the first menor- for the first light that was a spiritual kind of light. When the Jews... Sorry, man, go ahead. No, the, the, the Ner Tamid. What, what, what is that? What, what is that? What was Ner Tamid? Yeah. The Ner Tamid means in each, in a continual light. It doesn't mean... A, it means that it, it, it was sometimes that we found that light never actually went out. So we had that in the base of Mikdash? We had that in the base of Mikdash. We had the base of Mikdash time of Shimon Sadik. Yes, the light never we went out. in Mishkan? Well, it's not clear. Not clear. It says Tamid. Where would that be? What would that be? Physically, the, where would it be? The, uh, the, uh, either which candle would be? Either be the center candle or would be the second to last candle on the west. One so candle. One candle will, will, will last keep the longer. Uh, yeah. So the coin comes in and he doesn't need to bring the light. Well, he needs, so he needs light actually, right what there. he needs to do is to figure out what he needs to do, pull out the wick, clean out what was there, and then put it back in with mm-hmm. more oil. And can take light from there to. Uh, I'm not sure if he took light from there or he created another light to light the other window, other candles. Maybe he took light from there. Dugmar talks about that. I don't know what it says. And why is that Shabbos, besides the, the Gematria? What, what does that have to do with Shabbos? What has to do with Shabbos is the fact that the lights, the value of the light of Shabbos remains with the Jewish people, even though the Shabbos candles go out. Shabbos candles don't even last all Shabbos. Right. The Shabbos spiritual... So we count everything from Shabbos. Right, everything. so everything comes from Shabbos. The rest of in other words, do you... Do you live the week to make get to Shabbos, or do you live for Shabbos to get to the week, through the week? Say it again. Do you live through the week to get to Shabbos, or do you live through Shabbos to get to the, through the week? Now, the Shabbos, the Shabbos values, which really represent the spiritual values of the Jews, which is what Shabbos is all about, allows us to reprobe and resensitize ourselves to our neshama. So it's not that we're going to actually change right away, but it makes us aware of what our neshama is and the chinks that we have, the deficiencies we have in our neshama. Yes. Here's my question. Here's his question. Okay. <laughs> okay, Moshe, here's the deal. Yeah, I'm listening. The Mashiach arrives in either two fashions. Yes. One is the, war, the world is on the brink. Right. Or the other is when the Jews finally get it. Yep. Okay. There were, you can count it on your one hand, but there were times, maybe the Beit HaMikdash, maybe in the Midbar, we were together. So why did Mashiach come back then? Maybe it wasn't the right time to come at that point. But if Mashiach comes yeah. based on those criteria, first, why are they coming then? So first of all, who says we were completely together in the, in the base in the midbar? Why are we I'm you citing as no, 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 okay, I'm, 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 I'm responding. The I'm first responding. temple we were together. Shlomo builds the temple. Maybe. The Jews are good people. Yeah. Why is Mashiach not coming back? Forget the midbar. Well, maybe things weren't as completely as good as they could be. How could they get better than back in the oh, first temple? Oh. Okay. So Shlomo comes comes right up to David. For, for doing, for doing sins. So they're oh. good people. But they're, they're not perfect people. either. We're not perfect. We're never it's going to be perfect. Point you just said before, if we were perfect people, we should have brought Mashiach. Well, we were close to it. Based on what we know. I don't know how to make those values. They had a Beit HaMikdash that says it all. They had the ability to build a Beit HaMikdash. They were way more spiritual than we are today. Think about it. We have no Beit HaMikdash. Actually, I do think about it, but I do know there were pockets of vital worship that really remained. And I know, for example, that after Shlomo Melech, things kind of kind of break down a lot of places, especially... Well, that's where the tribes get dispersed. Correct. Correct. 
So it's hard to know. It's hard to kind of say. It's hard for me to know how to the measuring scale. Like, it's not like I can say they've gone from 9 to 9.2. So we've been around now almost 4,000 years. So I'd like to believe that actually I'm doing what I'm doing not because I'm going to, that only I'm going to bring Mashiach. You're doing it because of Mashiach? No, I'm not doing it only because of oh, Mashiach. I, I'm not, I'm not, I don't live at the end of the day, at the end of the day, I say, okay, I did this, and where are you, Mashiach? Well, how come you haven't come? Right. So I'd like to believe that I'm doing this because it makes me a better person, because it's the will of Hashem, and I can purify my soul. And I'm less focused on when and how Mashiach will come than on, on the actual spiritual values of elevating myself and give myself a, a sense of significance. So, so Masha, if, that's would, what you, I actually, would you be the way you are if there was no Olam Baba? Um, I actually probably would be. Do you think about when you, when you do good things in life, and you do... Do you think about rewards in all of my body? So actually, I actually don't really think so much about rewards in all of my body. I think more about how I'm a better person. Um, how, how the system, the system itself is a system that works. And I've used this now. I'm used to, I'll give you the analogy that I've used said many times. When I drive on the road, I don't really think that I'm going to, my, my insurance will go up or will go down. If I'm a really good driver, I'm a really poor driver, it affects my insurance rates. It costs me more money, it costs me less money. And we're all focused on money. I think just the, the rules of the road make a lot of sense. Now, I don't always understand all the rules of the road. Right. Like sometimes I, I, I don't know why it's 60 clicks and why it's not 80 clicks, or why it's 100, why it's not 120. Right? Um, or especially coming back from Israel where there's um, Highway 6, you've got a place where it's 120 kilometers an hour. It's amazing. They don't have that here. Why not? But surely the roads there are not as good as the roads here. But, but in general, I think the rules make sense. Red makes sense to stop. It's a good sign. Red has a certain connotation. Green makes sense. I drive on the right side of the road. I believe everybody follows the same rules. The city speed limits make sense. You know, I, do I understand everything? I understand everything. But I'm, really, I'm less focused on what my reward is going to be. I'm less focused there on the fact that I want to keep my rates and my insurance low and I don't want to gain demerit points. So, because I've been studying for 13 months, I've yeah. changed my, my thinking. I mean, I ask these questions. Right. But I like to debate. You know, I look at life like this. That if a person is lucky, they live 100 years. Let's say we're lucky. Okay. God willing, we should live 100 years. It's nothing in the scheme of the universe. So we're, we're not even a spec. We're not even, we're not a grand Correct. Spec. Okay. Alam Abba really is a great hedge, isn't it? Because if, if is or isn't? It is. Okay. Because if we're only going to live 100 years, if we're lucky, right. or even Marshall Rabbeinu, 120, then Alam Abba is the greatest hedge there is. Because if right. you're really a spec here, and you have eternity after, what a hedge. It is a hedge, but I don't... I don't, I don't do you really, not look at it like that? I do look at it like that, but I don't know how to define Alam Abba, what it really means. So I, I, I'm less focused on it. It is a great hedge, but I'm not sure how I can, how I can explain it. So I'm less focused on, I'm, I guess I'm, I guess a real, I'm a real person. I live in this world. I live in 3D. I live in 4D. But I, don't, but I can't visualize what 5D is. Now, I don't know how to define 5D. I believe it's there. I accept it's there. I live for it. But I don't know how to tell you what it means because I don't know how to find Hashem right now. I can't, I can't touch Hashem. Well, I am touching Hashem. Hashem is everywhere. But just in a different kind of way. It's the same way Olam Haba is going to be a very different kind of experience. What does that mean? I don't know how to define that. Mm-hmm. So uh, you asked me how I live my life. Uh, what, what would happen if suddenly you know, someone told me there's no Olam Haba? First of all, I don't think anybody could tell me that. Second of all, I don't know if, if, if it would, if they would tell that to me, still, I don't think it would make a difference to me. Now, maybe that's because I've lived my life although, you know, the way I am. So it's not a radical change. I'm less focused on what will be. I'm more focused on the lifestyle that I think actually creates good values. You've got to remember, I'm, I'm coming back. I'll just turn this off.